I am Dr. Sarah Williams, a licensed and board certified clinical psychotherapist. I have offered clinical services to executive clients, professional athletes, and political leaders. My greatest success is my ability to relate personally to the struggles of others after overcoming my own. My mission is to offer help to the hurting, bringing others out of darkness. Hello, this is Dr. Sarah Williams, and this is Dr. Sarah After Dark. In today's show, we will talk about trauma and the type of resilience that it takes to overcome trauma. In today's show, I will be interviewing Ms. Cameo Robinson and Dr. Nikita Key. It's an important show that may relate to most of us, so please stay tuned in to Dr. Sarah After Dark. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is bold, it's luxurious, colorful, and sexy. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is fun, it's stylish, sophisticated, and modern. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. Hello and welcome back to Dr. Sarah After Dark. I am talking to Dr. Key, who is a world-renowned international speaker and inspiring human service, services lecturer. Dr. Key is amazing and she's done so many wonderful things in her life and you would think that it was always been like that. So tell us, Dr. Key, can you share with us a little bit about your experiences and what, who is Dr. Key? Well, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I was born and raised in Detroit, a single mother household. My mother always went to school while I was in grade school. So I was responsible for taking care of my brother, um, preparing his meals and making sure that, you know, everything sort of ran while she was in school, if I was not at school with her. Um, so very, at a very young age, I learned how to sort of take lead. Um, so everything has not been easy. I was divorced, I married young was divorced very early on. Um, and so I raised two children by myself. Um, and I learned very early that I needed to make more money <laughs> to take care of these two kids. And in my mind, I needed to have at least uh, two incomes. I needed to be able to provide at the same level. Um, so I went back to school um, as a single parent and I worked on my PhD while working full time. And I thought about ways I can cut corners to make sure that once I finished school, I could be a professor. Um, and so that meant getting my teaching experience while working on my PhD, while working full time. So I worked part time, went to school, and I worked full time. Um, so I just had a plan and I sort of worked at that. But that plan didn't work perfectly. Perfectly, I just had one. Um, so part of it was, you know, way towards the end of my PhD, I was laid off from work. Um, I was laid off my full-time job, and even though I had part-time income, it could not take care of full-time needs. You know, it couldn't take care of two children. Um, and I ran out of funding for my PhD. And so I had to make some decisions, um, and, you know, doors open, but, you know, I was worried that it wouldn't work. Um, I was, you know, very, I put a lot of pressure on myself because I had to be two parents. You know, in my mind, I had to be two parents. I had to you know, run a, a household, my kids could not have anything different than they, what they would have had if both parents were there. And so um, I called around and made a lot of calls until I got the yes that I needed. Um, I kept calling school until I got a scholarship and they paid for me to finish my degree, um, even though they gave me two semesters to get it done in, but I got it done. Like I worked day and night until I could get that done. Um, and so, and it was, I didn't do it all by myself. I had a village and I had to actually create my village. Um, my parents were there to support me along the way to watch the kids or, or whatever, or to li at least listen to me cry. Um, but I was raised in church. My grandmother was a praying grandmother. Um, and so I knew that it would be taken care of. I knew that deep down, whether I didn't know what the answer was or what the outcome would be for sure, I knew it would be taken care of. And so. That is such an amazing journey that you've had to overcome to become Dr. Key. But what I'd like to know more about is along that journey, if you can relate your 
emotions. Like, was there ever a point that you felt emotionally, I can't do this? Or did you experience any type of anxiety or depression or mm -hmm. anything that a lot of us relate to mm -hmm. when we are going through challenges such as, like you just described? Mm -hmm. The funny part is I didn't experience depression or anxiety until later in my career. I relocated uh, here to Virginia for a position. They hired me to be assistant professor. They relocated me and my children here. Um, and so I didn't experience the depression or the anxiety until once I got here. And I think part of that was um, I didn't know anyone here. I, it was just me and my kids, my family, closest family was four to five hours away. Um, and so, you know, I didn't have my friends where I grew up. And, you know, I grew up in Detroit. I had everyone. There was no one that I couldn't call on. And here it was a little bit more isolated. And then I had to adjust to an academic environment that um, was an environment totally different than one that I grew up in. You know, um, in school, I, most of my school life, I, worked, I went to school with people that looked like me. Um, most of my adult life, I worked in a profession that people looked, at, looked like me. Um, but as a professor, the majority is, is white male professors. That's been a dominated field. And I, here I come, I'm this black female professor. So it was a little isolating. And during that process, right in the beginning, I can remember being really depressed and calling my best friend like, I feel depressed. Like, I've never felt like this before. And it felt like it would uh, never leave. It was a lot of crying. I can remember my son saying, Mommy, I just don't want you to cry no more. And that made me cry more. And so um, I would call my best friend and she told me to pray at five in the morning, every morning, and she would send me scriptures. And so I sort of prayed myself through, but still was pushing through. Um, part of it is because I needed to be you know, strong on the outside for my kids. And so I had that. And then later on in my career, I experienced some things where uh, because I'm not the typical professor. I don't look like the typical professor. I don't talk like the typical professor. I'm from Detroit, so I mean, it comes out. <laughs> and um, I experienced some things where it was, you know, you're not good enough to really be here. And I was working harder than anyone. I had more things happening, more things going on than anyone. And I kept working harder, but as you work harder, you often don't take care of yourself. Um, so I was there for everyone else except for myself. So I didn't have the balance between um, downtime and I can remember putting together my tenure package. It was time for me to um, either, in, as a professor, you either become tenure or that's it, career over, right? And so I had my first panic attack and I didn't know what in the world that was, <laughs> but I couldn't breathe, I couldn't do anything. And I, was, I started crying and I'm sitting there at this computer and I'm like, what is going on? And so that was my first real experience with um, anxiety, I would say. Um, I may have experienced it in other ways before, never noticing it, but having a panic attack, you notice that. Um, so I had one panic attack because I was not going to have another one. And so that just, I had to shift things and focus a little bit more on me. Correct. Mm -hmm. And in your, in your story, and I'm listening carefully because a lot of times with depression, the recipe for depression is one, isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, is a loss of your social system, your social support. Mm -hmm. Three is adjustment mm -hmm. because you were trying to adjust. Mm -hmm. Four is uh, biases or racism, gender bias mm -hmm. uh, based on culture or ethnicity or race. Mm -hmm. And all of those, plus you were trying to contend with being a mother, mm -hmm. being a parent. Um, Self-care is so important, and it sounds like you managed to implement spirituality as part of your self-care. Mm -hmm. I would ask um, your children, what are their ages now? My son is 18 and my daughter is 15. Okay, you almost made it. They're <laughs> almost there. They're almost there. Right. <laughs> so growing up with a single mom and, and watching you go through these challenges, how has it affected your children? How are they? The funny thing is, I've always focused on my children. So they moved here. My biggest thing was that they needed to have this social network. So I put them immediately in activities and stuff. And my kids, great. They are perfect. They have a whole full system of 
friends and people that they talk to. They do a lot of activities. They stay busy. Um, their grades are superb. Um, I was the only one that was suffering. So I put all the energy into them, built everything around them. Um, but I didn't look at, you know, how that was impacting me. So I was running all around the world, making sure my daughter was in dance competitions and she had what she needed to survive. And, but her mother didn't. And my son was in football and I was traveling and doing that. And I was doing that double the requirements that were for my profession. So, um, I just didn't know how to balance taking care of me and meeting the requirements of my profession. Yes, and it's ironic that in my doctoral research, I actually explored the experiences of women and graduate student stress mm -hmm. and lack of marital social support. Mm -hmm. And within that study, not just the experience of stress alone, but all the factors that go along with that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned being there for everybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. Being a good mother sometimes does not always equate to taking care of yourself, that there's a little bit of selfishness that's required mm -hmm. and you feel this guilt if you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you can also share with me once you experience your panic attack or you recognize that you needed help, what uh, avenues did you explore? I understand that your friend was a support system for you, mm -hmm. but were there, did you see a mm -hmm. therapist or okay. did you? So I think so part of it was I wasn't trying to be a good mother. I was trying to be the perfect mother. Uh -huh. So in my mind, my kids had to have gourmet meals. Like I made gourmet pancakes twice a week. I, I cooked big meals on Sundays. I did a number of things to make sure they had like this perfect. In my mind, I had to be two parents and I had to be perfect. So one of, one of the things that I had to think through was um, this idea of perfection and what that looked like for me. Um, I did go to counseling. Um, and I did counseling a little bit different. I looked for someone that looked like me, that um, talked like me, was in my age range, that could understand me. Um, and I met with her and it was more like a conversation that we had where I was teasing through some of the thoughts that I had and the experiences that I had or why I thought the way I thought. And she was challenging me <laughs> on those things. Um, and so I was able to put in a plan of downtime. And it was an adjustment for my kids because like I said, I made gourmet pancakes and my son will say something like, I haven't had pancakes in a month. And I'm like, but I taught you how to make those pancakes. You're 18 years old, you know? And so I had all this pressure and I was doing it all, but not, not functioning wholly, you know? And the kids are, you know, adjusting to that, but they all, both of them know how to cook. They may refuse to cook, but they both know how to cook. Everything that I make, they can make. Well, this sounds just so awesome. And it's amazing that you were able to overcome and be such an inspiration to everybody else. And we are just so thrilled that you chose to share your story with us today on Dr. Sarah After Dark. And I do hope that you'll come back because I know there's just so much more to you. You're so amazing. So thank you so very much. And I do look forward to having you back again. All right. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is bold. It's luxurious, colorful, and sexy. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is fun. It's stylish, sophisticated, and modern. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. And welcome back to Dr. Sarah After Dark. I am sitting here now with Ms. Cameo Robinson. And I would like to start out our segment by asking our audience to try to take a moment and imagine that you went to sleep on August 31st of 2018. Your day was relatively normal. And then in the early hours of September 1st, 2018, you received a call that completely altered and changed the course of your life. Cameo is here today to talk about her experience and to share with us about how she's doing on her journey. Thank you so much, Cameo. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, to start with my story, on the early hours, I received a phone call to inform me that my oldest son, Jamar Beach, 
who happens to be, happens to have a picture of him here. And Jamar was riding his motorcycle home from his job. He's riding down, and this happened in Raleigh, North Carolina, by the way. And he's riding down New Hope Church Road, and he reaches Bonville Court. As he reaches the uh, Bonville Court, there was an undocumented Mexican who failed to yield the right of way to him, hit him. Well, he hit the side of the van that the gentleman was driving, and he was decapitated. This gentleman continued and rode away with my son's body. And in doing so, he parked in the apartment complex that he lived in and left my son in the van, him and his friends, he wasn't alone. And they left him in the van and walked 200 feet to his apartment. And it was quite a ordeal because the van that he was driving, it didn't belong to him. It belonged to another Mexican who lived in Willow Springs, North Carolina. And they had to actually by the license plate, locate the registered owner, located him. Of course, he didn't know who had his van because the van is actually being driven by an illegal couple. So this gentleman, they had to locate. In that time, it was a four hour time frame. So once they located him, he did do a breathalyzer and he blew a .08 four hours after he had killed my son. And during that time, he refused to give blood. They didn't have probable cause at that time to obtain a warrant to make him give blood. He said he was scared of needles, although his whole entire neck is tattooed up. So that's how my journey began because, you know, I have another son who happened to be serving with the military over in Iraq. So I had to get him home. Uh, military gives him 10 days um, to be home. Well, it takes two days going and coming. So six days is what I was working with in order to have a funeral, um, to prepare the funeral arrangements, to get my son's body home, and actually just to even let it sink in that I had lost my oldest child. And on my journey, you know, I started a new job. Um, you know, going back and forth to Raleigh, North Carolina to deal with the um, hearing, to find out the details. Um, and I am a parent that I want to know everything when it comes to my children, good, bad, or indifferent. And in doing so, I requested, once I got with the police department and the DA's office to discuss the plea agreement that was being made um, for Mr. Carmona Cruz. And I wanted to see the pictures of my son. So that brings me to um, seeing him because his helmet did remain on his head. Um, his, there was no shock in his eyes. He looked like himself. And to look at his body in that van because he went through the window of the van. So his whole entire body um, remained in the van, which means the passengers that were in the van, they had to move his body in order to get out of the van. So that's what angers me, um, being that one, you're undocumented, so you, you don't belong here anyway. And then, but to show no remorse, because we did go to the hearing, um, that was two weeks ago. He did plead to an aggravating factor. He was charged with felony hit and run with serious injury or death. That charge in North Carolina only carries 13 months. So with that being said, I kept saying, hey, this man transported my son's dead body. So they added the aggravating factor, which carries 20 to 33 months. And in that time frame, he got 33 months, but he's been in jail since September the 1st. So he gets time served and he'll be eligible for parole in 14 months. And my goal is to make changes within North Carolina's laws they have a newly elected sheriff who is no longer honoring the ICE agreement that was made. So my, my goal is to try to have some kind of change because if we have so many people coming over undocumented and they're committing all of these heinous crimes and they're not being able to be held on an ICE detainer until they can be deported back home, something needs to be done. 
So that's my goal. Yes, and a lot of us are familiar with some of the facts we've seen on Fox News and other major networks talking about this traumatic story. And the backstory to this is, for instance, I can recall my mother when my brother was killed violently and suddenly. It's, it's a, a trauma that you can't really put words to. But my mother also said that nature doesn't prepare a mother to bury her child. Absolutely. And so your backstory is? It's, it's hard. You well, you don't see the, the anger, um, the grief, the tears, the, you know, just being distraught. And from day to day, you just don't know which emotion you're going to have to deal with. But being that I do have another son, I do have three grandchildren. My, my oldest son, he has a son who just turned two in December. So I also have to be strong enough for them and to be carry on. But me staying busy is what keeps me from falling into that deep depression. Not saying I'm not depressed because I am. Um, when you lose your son and it's still to a certain degree, it's not reality for me yet. But I will, re will not allow him to die in vain. And I'm going to do everything that I can possibly to make people aware of the laws because they definitely need to be changed and also to honor him because riding his motorcycle that was his way of feeling free we had the conversation and i understand that but my faith also carries me because his day was already planned so his purpose here in the physical it was done and i can see you know him pushing me to do what's necessary to get the changes. So that's what keeps me focused and keeps me so that I'm not sitting at home in a ball of tears. You know, I have something to look forward to, to fight for and just getting justice, even if it's not with the jail time, but just getting justice in general, that's what I'm aiming to do. And to become an advocate, to speak for mothers who don't have a voice or not ready to talk or is unable to talk because they are so distraught. That's what I want to do. And I want to be there for those mothers because I don't want anybody to have to go through what I'm experiencing. And traumatic grief is a different type of experience. It's a complex set of emotions that in your case was complicated by the injustice of all the other factors. To know that his life didn't matter and that he was not just your son, he's a father, he was a brother, he was a friend. I saw all the outlets throughout social media and there were so many people. Raleigh, North Carolina had to be shut down because everybody was grieving with you. But in the meantime, you are taking that and you're using that as a platform to somehow rescue, support, and offer inspiration to others. Well, I have to, um, being that I was a single mother, I know all the struggles. I was a single mother of two children, two boys, two young men now. And all, as a parent, you always want to make sure that your children have the best. And you're gonna always show them to fight. And I showed them to fight, you know, not physically fight, but when you see that there's some injustice, be a voice. Because if nobody speaks, there won't be any change. And so, and being, you know, I've always raised my kids to, and I've always instilled in them, you have three strikes against you before you walk out of the house. You're young, you're black, and you male. So you must go five to 10 steps ahead of everybody else just to even be recognized. And that's what I want to make sure that they were given that opportunity. And now that this has been you know, given and thrown upon me, then I'm going to be the voice for them and especially be the voice for him because he can no longer speak for himself. So I'm going to be the mother that I'm going to continue to speak. Give us the significance of your outfit today and the colors. Okay. Um, when going to the actual hearing, I was just going to wear red and black. And the red represents my son's bloodshed the black represents the grief that I'm going through. But I, in turn, I, I, I love co color coordination. So I told everybody that was attending the hearing, we're all gonna turn that court 
red and black so that this young man sitting in court will know that who you killed, he mattered. He had family, he had friends, you know, he had a host of people and we showed up and you saw, he saw that for himself. And I did have to offer him, you know, forgiveness. I gave him that. But at the same time, I wanted him to know this is what you've caused. So every time I'm in interview or doing a news conference or whatever, I'm always going to be in red and black. Correct. And you mentioned that he has a son, your grandson, and that has been quite an inspiration for you. And if you just give us quickly, I've seen it's Jamar Beach, so it's Life's a Beach. Is that the kind of going to be the platform for your mission in educating others? Yes, it okay. is, because that's what he always said, Life's a Beach, um, Beach being his last name. So. I carried on with that along with his friends. He have um, some childhood friends and they started, you know, saying life's a beach. So I just, I carried it and I picked it up. And so that's what my platform is because life is a beach, is a beach. you know, and it's, it's hard out here nowadays. And yes. so just to have a platform and be able to speak, you know, I didn't expect any of this, but I'm glad that it has been thrust upon me so that people will be aware of the different laws, the laws that you don't know about, and different things that go on, and you don't know until you've been thrown in the midst That's of it. Right. And I didn't know anything about the laws. Well, thank you so much for coming today and showing us your strength, and I just look forward to it, and we offer our prayers and support to you. And thank you so much for tuning in. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is bold, it's luxurious, colorful, and sexy. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is fun, it's stylish, sophisticated, and modern. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. Decorum, your leading contemporary furniture store. Contemporary is bold, it's luxurious, colorful, and sexy. And at Decorum, it's always a great value. Contemporary is my style. Inspire your style at Decorum. In today's show, we talk quite a bit about depression and traumatic loss. With depression, when we experience depression, it's usually signaled by a loss of uh, experience in life, isolation, lack of social support, a change, and the stress from maybe single parenting. We also learned about traumatic loss and what that experience can be. But from each guest, we learned resilient factors that can help us all move from the darkness into light. Thank you for tuning in to Dr. Sarah After Dark, and please join us next week.